Uh, my name is Adele Forth. I'm in the Department of Psychology and in the area of Forensic Psychology. Well, I'm the director of the Psychopathy Research Lab. And in our lab, we do research on psychopaths. And this research covers a range of topics. So we want to know, first, we need to be able to identify who psychopaths are in order to study them. So we do quite a bit of research on developing assessment tools to identify these individuals. And we also do research on these underlying mechanisms for why someone might develop into becoming a psychopath. And we do research looking at the differential correlates of psychopathy, both in offenders, in forensic psychiatric patients, and we also look at uh, psychopathic traits in university students. So psychopathy is uh, been around for many, many years. It's not a new disorder. It's conceived to be a personality disorder with a constellation or defined by a constellation of traits. So there are interpersonal traits, manipulative, grandiose, arrogant, dominant, those type of traits. There are emotional traits where these individuals show callous, lack of empathy, lack of remorse, lack of a conscience. They also tend to have very shallow uh, emotions, very cold, unfeeling individuals. They have behavioral traits. They tend to be risk takers. Uh, engage in uh, uh, stimulation seeking, uh, they tend to be quite irresponsible individuals, very impulsive individuals, and they, this disorder or precursors of this disorder tends to emerge relatively early in life and they tend to manifest uh, in engaging in antisocial acts. So even if people out there listening to this might say, oh, I have one of these characteristics or traits, that doesn't make you a psychopath. It's the grouping or the clustering of all these traits. And it has to be to quite an extreme before you would be labeled or categorized as a psychopath. Now, the prevalence, most of the research, uh, researchers do research in prisons because that's where you find the most psychopaths. So about 10% of an incarcerated prison population would have many, many psychopathic traits. Uh, so that's why we go to prisons. However, most recent research indicate that psychopathy is on a dimension. You're not an a psychopath or not a psychopath. So we can then start doing research in other populations, for example, university students. So although, thankfully, I don't find many high-scoring psychopaths here at Carleton, there are a range, there's a range in traits, and I can look at that range and uh, test some of the predictions I have. And there's been two large-scale, randomized, stratified uh, 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 research studies indicating that the prevalence of psychopathy in the community is about 0.5%, so less than 1%. And a recent study done by researcher Hare, Bob Hare and uh, Babiak has looked at cor um, CEOs and corporations and found about 4%. So it's much higher. The general population, relatively rare. You start moving into different occupations, you might start finding higher rates or prevalence rates of psychopathy. Well, there's a number of studies going on right now. One area that we're starting to do research uh, on that is completely neglected in the research literature. There's been many, many years of studies looking at the psychopath but almost no research looking at the survivor of the psychopath. There's been one study that's been published uh, in 2005. I have two lines of research here. We've done one study already looking at survivors who were in an intimate relationship with their, the psychopath. So these are individuals who uh, got married, started dating, uh, that sort of thing. And we, this was an online survey where they indicated what were their experience dealing with the psychopath and the consequences. And the consequences for most individuals span physical, emotional, financial, and it's extremely long-lasting. There was one uh, participant who was about 78 years old, who was 78 years old, and it was her experience with the psychopath went back to when she was 19 or 20 years old. And she carried with her this experience for so many years, and she was very thankful at the opportunity to describe what happened. 
Uh, so we've, we've done that study. Uh, that study has been submitted for publication and we're in the midst of revising, uh, doing a revision on that. We're now moving to the corporate world. So I have a master's student who is going to look at uh, psychopathic bosses and psychopathic co-workers. So not an intimate re relationship but in the, in the working world and looking at the consequences and what they do in terms of bullying, cyberbullying, that sort of thing, how they manipulate the system in the corporate domain. So that's one area we're moving to. We're also starting to look at uh, interrogation. So uh, the police are very interested in psychopaths. They believe that a psychopath may have different, different motives for committing offenses. So how they uh, assess or inter interrogate a psychopath may well be different from how they interrogate someone who does not have psychopathic features. So one thing we're now looking at is looking at to see whether or not psychopaths differ in what we call interrogative suggestibility. And interrogative suggestibility is a construct that is linked to false confessions. So we are hypothesizing that psychopaths actually will be less likely to falsely confess to the crime. However, there may be different motives for falsely confessing. So they may, may still engage in uh, false confessions, but for different reasons. So those are the two newest areas of research. The other area that I've been doing research in is some concerns about ethical issues and professional issues with labeling individual psychopaths. One of the uh, instruments I developed was an assessment instrument to look at psychopathic traits in adolescents. And the major concern in this field is that we do not, I'll repeat, we do not want professionals to label a 12-year-old as a psychopath. Instead, we want to acknowledge that these individuals are high risk, they have a very high likelihood of going on to a long-term criminal career, so what we should be doing is identifying them and putting a huge amount of resource in and to support them and, intervent and, and develop intervention programs. So I am concerned about the potential mislabel and ethical use of the term uh, psychopathy. So I do also have research with the adult system looking at how psychologists and psychiatrists present evidence in criminal courts. So I have another PhD student who's looking at what uh, expert witnesses say in the court about their assessment in the realm of psychopathy. So certainly those are my areas of research. I welcome anyone who's interested in psychopathy to contact me and you'll see an email below.